Easter egg. Snow on Mount Silver. So my brother and I, we uh, kind of grew up on Pokemon. Around here, a lot of us kids did. It worked out perfectly for us too. Every time a new gen came out, one of us would get one version, and one of us would get the other. And since our mom liked to spoil us, we both got the third one. This is going to sound at first like a bittersweet story about two siblings who grow up on a couple of games that eventually take them down two different paths. Well, it's a little more than that. The years rolled by, we kept collecting, Game Boys got old, we replaced them, cartridges finally gave out, and we picked up new copies. But we started down two completely different roads before Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald came out. You see, around then my brother got a Game Shark. We had heard about all the cool hacks and cheats you could do with them, even if we were a little late to the party, and we were eager to try them out. Our first guinea pig cartridge was my brother's old blue version. We just dicked around with it for a little bit, nothing major, but whatever we did, fucked the cartridge up. After just a couple of code entries, it glitched out completely and became unplayable. Naturally, we were upset at this. My brother mourned the loss of his hours worth of work, and I was sympathetic. I told him it was okay. We can replace it. Stupid shark was a waste of money. But it was here where our paths finally differed. After seeing the mess it had turned blue version into, I had become fully opposed to the idea of hacking or cheating any of my games. What can I say? Sometimes I can act like a girl. I have feelings for the little pixel critters. But my brother had taken his game's destruction as a personal challenge. I don't think he ever played a game again that wasn't hacked somehow. Yeah, we played a shit ton of Pokemon, man. But for us, there wasn't really much to do. We live way out in the middle of the country without many other kids, and the farmers, of course, didn't want us on our property. So, we played Pokemon, out on the lawn just about every day. It was pretty awesome to us, at least. We lost the Game Shark when our rooms got moved around. A new addition was built onto our house, and it disappeared in the mess of shit that got stuffed into the closet. Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald had just arrived, and after playing through them once, we were both in agreement that they were definitely lacking in comparison to the last gen. We both tried another honest playthrough, and though we managed to finish it, it just left us both yearning for some good old-fashioned nostalgia. Where were our old gold, silver, and crystal cartridges? It took us probably a month to dig through the boxes we'd been too lazy to open up before, but we finally found one full of our old electronics. My old purple Game Boy still worked. His red one could no longer hold the batteries in place. Both of our GBAs were fine, though, along with our snake lights and link cables, that one with the nifty little connector in the middle that I always wrapped up oh so carefully to avoid fraying the wires and condemning it to the trash like our last cable. We both grabbed up everything we could. It was so nice to have Yellow, which had been my first and most cherished game in any of the series, not just Pokemon, and to have Red and Gold back as well. We went through the motions of checking our old files, taking in all the good memories, and eventually, we figured that Gen 1 stuff is just too nostalgic to get rid of. I restarted Gold, and he restarted Silver. Immediately, he snatched the Game Shark out of the box and slipped it into the back of his GBA. I could only shake my head at him, and I even remember what I said to him. That thing will kill your game, you know. He never really liked me preaching to him about abusing pixels. So I just shut my mouth after that, but it had put him off from playing with me. I guess it was just one time too many or something. Uh, I ought to know just to keep my thoughts to myself, really. It was a couple of days later when it happened. I was out on the porch, Game Boy in hand, 
and just about to go into the Elite Four when I realized I needed a little bit of help. My team was all balanced thanks to me playing through for leisure, and at the time, I was no great trainer that could pull off gimmick runs. I knew that my brother had been two badges ahead of me when we last checked in with each other, so I was hoping that maybe he'd let me borrow a Pokemon or two, just for this run through. Now the thing is, is that I'd spent the last 24 hours at a friend's place. I had literally come home, dumped my bag in my room, and crept out into the sun with my GBA to play. I had no idea what he'd been up to. For all I knew, he was done with the game and was on to a new one. Which, I figured was all the better for me, since he wouldn't be needing those Pokemon anytime soon. So I got up and went into the house. And when I was crossing the living room, I noticed all his Pokemon games were lying on the floor. Some of the cartridges had been mangled, like they'd been hacked at with something sharp. Even his old blue version, long ago dead and too sentimental to throw away, was just lying on the floor with the plastic cut raggedly, split almost halfway up one side, completely unusable, even if it would have worked. I was a little scared. This had to have happened this morning, otherwise our mom would have seen the mess and they wouldn't be lying on the carpet. Tucking my GBA into my pocket, I crept over to his room and found the door unlocked. Somehow, that was even more concerning. I walked in and found my brother sitting on the edge of his bed. His GBA was in pieces on the floor at his feet, smashed to bits. Next to him on the bed was a hammer and her mother's gardening scissors. His face was paler than I'd ever seen it, even whiter than the time we'd gone corning and the old guy up the street, legally blind in a raving nutcase, had come and chased us into the trees with a shotgun. It was now I also noticed that the game shark was on the ground and had a silver cartridge poking out from under his bed. Somehow, they had been spared the wrath of the hammer. Are you okay? I asked. I remember the chills that ran through me. He was my little brother. Seeing him like this was horrifying. It was awful. I remember him rasping. The way that his voice rattled made my knees go weak. Oh, God. White. White everywhere. And then, black. I remember running over to him and hugging him. I remembered his limp arm fell and brushed the Game Boy in my pocket. And then he suddenly screamed right in my ear, making me jump and bite my tongue by accident. He ripped the handheld from my pocket and hurled it at the far wall. I cried out at the dent that the plastic system made and ran over to collect it. The screen had gone dark and I feared the worst, but when I flicked the switch, it powered up normally. I waited there in the corner, trying to pretend that the GBA mattered enough not to go and run for our mom. The volume was on and when the Pokemon theme started up, he screamed again, picking up the hammer. This time I screamed too and ran far from the room with the GBA clutched to my chest like a shield. He ended up in the psych ward at the hospital for two days. When we went to go visit him, I would leave my GBA at home. No one could figure out what had set off his strange maniac behavior. There was some talk that I didn't understand at the time about some kind of disorder he may or may not have had. But even though Mom and I had collected and brought in all the cut-up cartridges to be looked at, no one had even thought to tie it back to the game. I hadn't said a word about what had happened when he accidentally touched my Game Boy, or the blind white terror that he'd been thrown into when the music had started. On my last visit to the hospital, before school on the second day, I was left alone in the room with him, 
while mom had some private talk with the doctor about precautions to take should this ever happen again. I sat in a chair next to his bed where he was staring at the ceiling. But then suddenly, he sat up, making me flinch. Hey, Andy, go in my room when you get home. I didn't understand what he meant, and then I remembered the things we hadn't picked up in his room. The game and the hacking tool under his bed. Get rid of them. I don't want to ever play that game again. His voice sounded so weary and desperate. He sounded like an old man on his deathbed. My poor, damaged little brother. How could I refuse? Promise, you'll get rid of them. All right, I promise. I was carted off to school late, and through the whole day, I only had my promise to him in my head. I didn't know it at the time, but this would be the last time that I could ever play the big brother role and help him out. I just had to get home and get rid of that game. But as the day went on, a sick curiosity started to go through my head. What could have possibly have happened in that game that scared him so badly? I was scared too, but I just had to know. I had to. I got home and went right into his room, bent on uncovering whatever horror was waiting for me. Mom had since vacuumed the room, and the cartridge and game shark were no longer visible. I got down and crawled halfway under his bed, feeling timid, but holding onto the promise I made as my badge of courage. Under the bed, there was enough dust to make me cough, enough old Legos and other various toys that I couldn't set my elbow down without it landing on something. But I finally saw both objects. They'd been shoved into a corner on top of a notebook that looked too new to have been down there for long. I'm thinking, I grabbed the corner of the paper and dragged everything out with me, still wheezing from the dust. Allergies and all. They looked so innocent. Simple toys and a basic spiral bound journal. When I set Silver and the Game Shark on the floor, I took a closer look at the notebook. On it were scrawled at least 20 different cheat codes, but one had been scratched out with Sharpie over where it had initially been drawn in with pen. This was confusing. He had really tried to erase it out. The marker had been pressed to the paper so hard that the ink soaked through most of the pages behind it. But pen has a way of sticking around. I picked up the notebook and tilted it backwards in the light, and the reflective surface of the sharpie revealed the indents that had been left where he had written. The code was an unintelligible mess of letters and numbers, but the words next to it confused me. Easter egg, snow on Mount Silver. I remembered what he said when I found him. He had been raving about white, white, and then black. Could he mean snow? Even though it was only August and the temperature was still climbing to 90 degrees every day, a chill ran down my spine. Did I dare play this? I picked up everything and brought it to my room and laid it out on the carpet in front of me with my own GBA next to it. For a long time, I just stared down at it. And the longer I looked, the more maniacal Lugia's face became on the sticker. Like some kind of twisted grin. Like it was daring me to find out what had happened to my younger brother. I was a 14-year-old kid. Did I really want to tempt fate 
and risk ending up like him? I glared down at Lugia for a while longer. I had to see. I slid gold out of my GBA and stuck silver in its place. It took me almost 15 minutes to compose myself and to turn it on. It started up normally. I left the sound on low, too afraid of what I might hear to keep it up the full way, but I was too curious to mute it. The title screen was normal too. Lugia again, but somehow menacing, despite my common sense telling me it was exactly the same picture. How bad could this be? His notes said Easter egg. Didn't that mean that there was already coding in the game? The menu came up, still absolutely normal. His character was Blake, with a mostly filled Pokédex. But the time was odd. Nine, nine, nine hours, nine, nine minutes. I knew he couldn't have been playing that long. I had barely logged 50 hours on my own game, and I was at the Elite Four, and I was playing slowly. Probably the result of his hacking fucking up his file. Well, whatever then. The game started up, and the first thing that I noticed was the prolonged black screen. It took almost a minute for anything to change, and there was no sound at all. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing up already, but it was too late to turn back. Finally, a very dim sort of map came onto the screen, but it looked like static. I squinted down and realized with a fearsome pang that it was actually the Mount Silver map. But what I thought was static was heavy falling snow. So this is where he had last saved his game. I checked his party. A very normal team for someone who'd been using a game shark. Typhlosion, Feraligator, Meganium, Pidget, Tyranitar, Lugia, all level 100 with modded moves. Typical for him. Something about the sprites was strange though. They seemed sullen in a way. Their colors seemed washed out and their expressions lacked the usual vigor that they normally had. I chalked this up to missing pixels or something, also due to his hacking. The map had brightened up just a smidgen when I closed out of the start menu. Indeed, snow was somehow falling very heavily. Pixels danced across the screen so fast that it was hard to see the little sprite that was my brother's character. Something was off about him too. When I checked the information, it was the same as the other Pokemon sprites. The colors were dull. In fact, now that I thought about it, he almost looked frostbitten. My stomach tightened, and I turned and tried to move down the mountain. As I hit the bottom of the screen, words popped up, and there was a sound. My sprite hitting an invisible wall. I can't turn back now. That was... unsettling. I went into my Pokemon and tried to use Pidgeot's fly ability. I can't fly in this. Obviously referring to the snow. Fuck this, I thought, going to his bag. There was an escape rope, and I tried using it. I can't go back anymore. What was going on? Once again, I tried to walk down the mountain. And to my horror, the words changed with every attempt. I can't run away. I can't go back down. I can never go back. 
this last one sent a frigid feeling through my heart. There was no way down the mountain. I had to climb. Turning the little spread around, I moved him forward. No resistance at all, though my walking speed was oddly slow. What was truly weird was the lack of grass, of trainers, of anything at all, but the white snow, which still blew across the screen and made it almost impossible to see. As I moved further up the mountain, his walking speed became slower and slower. The static curtain of pixels grew thicker so that I could barely make out any features of the map. But it seemed like the only way to move was straight ahead. I reached what looked like a set of stairs at the very top edge of the screen. I didn't remember this being there before. As I tried to move up, the little sprite paused. I'm cold. By now, even I was getting goosebumps. His walking speed had become painfully slow, as if somehow he was being impeded. More text appeared on the screen. The Kenyum has died. What the fuck? I thought. Pokemon don't die in these games. I checked in my party and was frightened and confused by what I saw. Meganium's sprite had been replaced by a red X. All my other Pokemon sported varying degrees of damage, though I hadn't battled once. I went into my bag and found a single revive and tried to use it. It's too late. What kind of easter egg was this? There wasn't much else I could do. Trying to turn around yielded the same messages as before. So I kept moving. Pidgeot has died. I checked again. And sure enough, there was a little red X. This time, I selected it and looked at the Pokemon itself trying to figure out what was wrong. I wish I hadn't. The sprite was mangled. Pieces of it were missing. What was left was splotched with a sickish blue-gray color, and its eye was a solid black pit. I flipped down to Meganium. Same deal. A leg missing. A chunk of its neck and most of its head, save that pitch black dead eye. Morbid curiosity urged me onward, and the path never deviated from the straight upward road I traveled the entire time. Along the way, every now and again, another party Pokemon would die, and an examination of its sprite would show it would be in the same condition as the others, until all that was left was Typhlosion. One more staircase was ahead. I climbed it, braced for whatever horror awaited me. I hit the summit. It was deserted. Red was nowhere to be found. The snow then stopped falling. In the very center of the map was something sticking out of the snow. It looked like a Pokeball. Okay, maybe all this creepy shit led up to some climactic final battle using whatever was in there. If I picked it up, maybe Red would come out of hiding. I walked over and examined it. And then there was a loud burst of static that came from my game that made me jump. What appeared on screen was a battle animation. My trainer sprite appearing his skin tinged blue against another mangled Pokemon sprite. It was Celebi, in the center of that black hole that was its eye. 
A single red dot burned out like an ember. The thing looked rotted. I didn't even throw out my mostly dead Typhlosion before it moved. Celebi used Parish Song. A screech came out of my GBA, and I almost dropped it as the screen went white. A part of me was relieved, thinking that my final Pokemon had been KO'd and I'd be transported to a Pokemon Center. But I was wrong. My sprite reappeared in what looked like a cave. Was I now inside the mountain? I checked my trainer card and felt sick. The sprite was just as mauled as the Pokemon had been. A leg gone, a single eye remaining, pitch black, and so, so sad looking, tears welled up at the corner. Every color on him was replaced by those sick shades of frosty blue and gray. Every stat on the card was reduced to zero, except the time, which still read 999 hours, 99 minutes. I quickly moved back to the map. His sprite there mimicked the horror it had been on the trainer card. Pieces were missing. Everything was discolored. I started trying to walk, and at first, I received a message. It's so cold. There was only one direction to go. Upward. I moved on, and every now and then, a message would appear that made my heart sink lower and lower. Mother, it feels so cold. I can't go on. The walls as I walked became darker and darker until they were pitch black at the end. There was an exit marked only by a white outline. I had no other choice but to go through it. It opened into a chamber that was also solid white. The only way to distinguish the walls was a thin gray line that marked them as separate from the floor. Against the wall, there was another sprite. Red sprite, intact. I had come this far. I had to finish this. I walked right up to him and hit A. Dot, dot, dot. A battle had started. Red Sprite had none of the deformities that matched my own. The colors were the same blues and grays, but he was still intact. He just looked extremely sad. His first Pokemon came out, Venusaur. It was level zero with a speck of health. I sent out Typhlosion, who just had six hit points left. No Pokemon made a sound when they were brought into battle. Venusaur, you struggle. There was no animation, just a single point of damage done to Typhlosion. And then the opposing sprite dropped off the screen. Venusaur has died. There was no text asking me to switch out. Instead, there was what appeared to be dialogue from Red. Dot, dot, dot. His next Pokemon was Blastoise, even more mangled than the Venusaur had been. It too struggled and died. After each round, there was that ominous dot 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 from Red. Every sprite was more damaged than the last. His Espeon was barely distinguishable as a Pokemon. I realized somewhere he was sending them all out of order, which saved one Pokemon for last. Pikachu came out, 
and it was grotesque. It too was discolored like it was frostbitten. It was missing an ear, half its body and tail. Its head was mostly intact, but its eyes were much larger than they should have been, and glared out at me like pitch black windows into hell. But the thing that got me the most was the giant smile that extended almost all the way to the edges of its head. Its health was somehow at zero, or at least looked that way. My hands were shaking. I didn't get a chance to attack. Pichu used pain split. Pichu has died. Typhlosion has died. It cut back to the image of Red Sprite. And now, it looked like mine. With his body so butchered, it looked like a carcass stripped of most of its meat. Except it had those same, soulless, deranged eyes as Pikachu. I finally understood what had happened. They were dead. They were all dead. And the sub-level of the mountain was the hell they now existed in. Red finally spoke. It's over. The screen flashed black and white for a moment. Used destiny bond. A horrible, hideous screeching started to issue from my GBA. The screen went white and it shrieked at me, and I threw it to the floor and pressed my back against the bed. The horrible noise continued for several long moments while the screen stayed white, then went black. There was only silence. It took me a few long moments, but eventually I stood up. I took that game shark, I took the notebook, I took that fucking possessed game, I picked them all up and I carried them to the garbage can, and I threw them in. When I got back to the house, I don't know what made me do it, but I picked up yellow version and I inserted it into my Game Boy. I think it was a part of me determined to make sure I hadn't somehow been tainted as well. The music started up. The game played. I turned to my Pikachu and hit A. Its smiling face greeted me with an ear twitch and a big pixelated smile. A pleasant, normal smile. I turned my game off and spent the next hour crying on the floor. My brother and I never did play Pokemon together again. He gave it up for good. But I stuck to replaying my comforting, unhacked games. That winter, the snow fell thick.